Is it good now? It's good now. All right, let's try it again. How's it going? <laughs> Woo. I know I'm the last person today, but like, I really need your energy because it's going to be an intense talk. So let's do this, okay? Come on, guys. How are we doing? Woo! Awesome, cool. Okay, so my talk is on building universal JavaScript applications with React. Uh, my name is Rami Sayar. I'm a senior tech evangelist at Microsoft Canada. I'll explain what that means in a second. But first, I just have to say that together today, we are on a quest. Uh, and I, I couldn't find anything more epic than a ninja cat waving a flag riding a dinosaur uh, that has these fork arms. Uh, so I figured that was probably the most appropriate image for us to describe this quest because uh, it's going to be pretty intense. It's going to be very challenging. I'm going to be doing some uh, real code, like live code in front of you guys. Uh, so it's, it's going to be really interesting. Um, my name is Rami Sayar. Uh, that's probably the best way to reach out to me. Uh, that's my Twitter handle out there. Uh, and what I do is I work with startups and developers across the country, and I help them build their technologies. Uh, my specialty is web and open source software, so I spend most of my time uh, playing with React, uh, Node.js, Python, PHP, uh, helping get those applications up into the cloud, uh, helping making them work across various different browsers. Uh, so that's pretty much what I do. So if you've got any other questions or any questions about React or any other framework, really, uh, I work with a lot of different folks, so I've gained uh, quite a bit of knowledge about how different people do things and how different uh, problems are solved. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'll be very happy to, to chat with you. Um, so what you will learn today, it's going to be really intense. Uh, first, we're going to cover what is universal JavaScript. Then we're going to uh, talk about how to write React on the back end uh, with Node.js. And then we're going to actually take a React application and universalify it. Uh, it's a word I invented. <laughs> um, I couldn't find a, another one, uh, but that's what we're going to do. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how to structure your application once you like, have an idea of how universal JavaScript apps work. Uh, and then cover some tools, some scaffolding tools as well. And then lastly, if we have uh, some time, uh, go through uh, Next.js, which is this uh, new universal JavaScript framework that's out there that's built on top of React. So it's going to be intense. Uh, and that's why I have that photo of me. Um, as I, I couldn't, again, I was really bad with GIFs this time, so <laughs> those are the best photos I could find. <laughs> um, so introducing universal JavaScript. Uh, just, just to get a feel for the room, how many of you are building React apps today in your workplace? Awesome. How many of you have a universal app? Two people. Okay, by the end of today, everybody should be able to build a universal app. Uh, sweet. So um, it was formerly known, this term, universal JavaScript, used to be, or sort of is, some people still call it this, uh, isomorphic JavaScript. Um, I prefer the term universal JavaScript because isomorphic, if you actually look at the definition, it's a little bit too strict for what we're trying to do. Uh, so I call it universal JavaScript, but you might see it around uh, the web as isomorphic JavaScript instead. Um, and basically the idea here is... Um, you want to write code that runs on both the client and the server side. So Node has matured very well. It's being used in full-time production applications, including at Microsoft. Uh, and it, it's, it's a fully fledged system. Like People actually develop um, you know, production code with Node.js. Uh, Node, the, uh, the V8 JavaScript engine that it's based on, it's from the Chrome project. Uh, it's the same one that's in your browser. So here's the idea. Well, if we have the same uh, runtime in both the browser and in Node, all right, and we're, we're already comfortable with uh, JavaScript, why not just use both, um, like basically the same application or build the code in, in a way where the same application could be run on both the browser side and the server side. All right, so we don't have to rewrite the same app and the same views and the same templates uh, in uh, Express or in Sales.js on the back end. We could just use our React app and just have it render on the back end. So that's the idea of universal JavaScript. Um, so in an ideal world, it would be the exact equivalent, right? Like the same code, same lines of code would run on one side as they would on the other side. But we can't always achieve that, so let's be pragmatic about it. I'm not saying that you can write every single line and have it be the same. I'm saying that about 95 to 99% of your code will be the same, which is very reasonable and very advantageous to us. Um, so why? Why is this awesome? Well, one, because we're sharing code between the front end and the back end. We no longer have the separation. Uh, we're using the same dev tools, the same packaging tools, the same modules tools. Uh, we're deduplicating uh, our business logic, so we don't have like the same business logic uh, in two different places, and therefore less errors will be introduced into our code. Um, and lastly, if you've already been building with React today, uh, and you don't have a universal uh, framework, uh, well, then you're, you're missing out on a lot of the search engine 
uh, optimization that you could be doing because although Google indexes JavaScript pages really well, other search browsers don't, and even Google will like, you know, not be able to get everything out of your application if you're just building a single page app with JavaScript. So with this and having this uh, server-side rendering as well, this uh, same code base on both sides, you'll even be able to get a uh, better search engine optimization as well. And lastly, the, the thing that I actually find very interesting uh, when we're looking at why we're doing universal JavaScript is because it sort of forces us to actually have a very strict data access policy. So how do we actually access the, the database? We tend to take shortcuts when we're in the back end because we're, you know, we're, we can actually connect to the database. But by forcing us to have the same code on the back end as in the front end, now we have to rethink, okay, well, what, did it, what it means to actually do a SQL query to a database. Are we going to be doing that, or should we also be asking uh, a, a REST API in the back end as we would on the front end as well? Um, so it's really interesting stuff. That's why universal JavaScript is it's a, it's a trend that's picking up. It's really interesting for us right now, and it's something that I'm actively working on, and I've seen a lot of companies now actively move towards. So I'm going to be sharing with you a lot of different stuff, so I'm really excited about all this stuff. Like, um, <laughs> uh, I have a dog, <laughs> and I know what it means when they're super excited, and I, that's how I feel right now. Like, this stuff is really cool. It's cutting edge. Um, very few folks have all functioning stacks like this. So... Uh, let's dive into it. Um, there's four important concepts and challenges um, that you will need to face if you're looking at building a universal application. Uh, one is we're going to have to start module sharing. The same, if we want the same code to be running on the back end and the front end, it has to function, right? Like, um, so through the example app that I'm going to show you and how we universal, uh, universalify it, uh, you'll see that um, there is actually a module that we have to drop into the back end because that functionality does not exist outside of a browser. Right? So this uh, module sharing idea is, is, is really important. Um, this idea of universal rendering, so if it renders on the browser, it also has to render the exact same way on the server side right? because we want to share that same rendering code and actually send it over to the browser uh, from the server directly. So instead of having this blank screen of, of, of white, uh, when the, your application loads until the JavaScript starts running, we actually will have real HTML in there. And then the React app and the single page app on the other side will pick up right from there. So that's what we're trying to do as well. That's a, a concept that we need to have in mind. Uh, another concept is universal routing. So how does routing work on the back end as it does on the, on the, on the front end, right? Like if you're doing hash routing, does that make sense to, to keep the, ha the hash routing in your app? Uh, if you also need to render it on the back end where you know, your web server might be losing some of those queries and some of that, that part of the URL. So we have to think about that a little bit more carefully. And then lastly, how do we do uh, universal data access from both the server and the, and the, the browser side? Um, so again, I just want to reinforce this, that this is probably where you guys are at right now if you're not already following this, this pattern, right? You probably have a separate application that's running on your server side. Uh, your client application if you, is completely different. If you're using JavaScript on both ends, then you might have some shared code. It'll be that little sliver of orange in the middle. Uh, but really, what we're trying to get to is this, where it's most of the code is roughly the same. The same. All right, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to take the ToDo MVC app. Uh, have most of you seen that app before? Raise your hands if you have. So I have an idea? OK, great. So they have a React version of that application. I'm going to take that React version, and I'm going to make it into a universal app. And we're going to do this live on, on, on the screen. Um, so there's a bunch of steps that we need to do. Uh, the first one is actually understand how it works, because it's a, it's a bit of an interesting app in the way that it's done. Uh, there are some decisions that were made, because there's other to-do MVC apps as well. So they're, they're already sharing some code with other frameworks. Um, so they, they have some decisions like that. Next is, it actually doesn't use React. Uh, sorry, it doesn't use um, uh, Webpack. Sorry, not React. <laughs> uh, my bad. It actually doesn't use Webpack at all. Like, it doesn't use this uh, um, transpiler. It actually transpiles everything uh, in the browser. So that's not going to work for us on the, on the, on the back end. Uh, and uh, the other thing is that actually the, the, the library that it uses has been uh, deprecated. Uh, so there's some old code in the React app that we'll actually update. Uh, and then we're going to set up React routing in a way that's uh, universal friendly. Uh, and then we're gonna, I'm going to show you how to write some express code to actually uh, render React on the server side. And then we're going to set up universal data retrieval. Um, so if you're wondering, OK, well, where can I get this code? Um, so I, we actually had an interesting conversation earlier. When folks say that they're going to live code, it's because they weren't prepared. 
That's not true in my case. I actually have a repo with all the steps in a different folder, so you can actually go through this yourself. Uh, and even if you wanted to follow through right now, you can go pop up your laptop screens and just clone this repo. Um, I've tried really hard to minimize the changes between the original Todo MVC app and mine, uh, just to make it like that there's less steps, so it's a little bit easier. Um, but even though some of the steps might not be the best practices as we know them right now to build React applications. So uh, you might not like the way some things are written, but I, that's because I've, I've been trying to minimize the changes. Um, so OK, let me start you off. I'm going to switch to my screen. You'll see me switch between the slides and my desktop uh, quite a bit. Uh, the first thing I want to do is I actually want to just pop in uh, and show you this is what the, uh, this is what the uh, folder structure looks like. You've got the begin, step one, step two, step three, the end. Uh, folder, and then there's the next JS demo. So if you download it, that's that's where we're going to be. And I'm going to start with the begin folder. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do actually is I'm going to show you what it looks like. So I'm just going to start a very simple uh, HTTP server using Python. All right, and I'm just going to open up a browser here and go to localhost. Show you what it looks like. So this is what it looks like right now. Okay, uh, we mentioned I really like ramen. It's on my to-do list for today. Uh, go have ramen with Alfred, uh, who's one of the organizers. Um, it's, it's a really cool app. It's very simple. Uh, I'm going to check mark this soon. But once it's check marked, you should be able to see it in the completed tab. Uh, you'll notice the URL up here. It's using the hash pattern. So that maybe that's not what we want, right? Uh, and then you, know, you can add a hello. Um, you can see that this is active. This is completed. These are all the tasks that we have. You can clear the completed ones. So there's a database that's actually going on here. So if I actually refresh this page, the, the, the tasks are still there. So that, that in your mind, sh you, know, you should think that they, maybe they're using local storage, which is in fact what's happening here. Um, so there's some interesting stuff going on in this app. It's not like a very simple Hello World app. It's a real functioning to-do app, right? Not very, not has the most, like it's not Outlook, but you know, it, it does the job, right? And maybe, maybe people don't want to use Outlook. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Um, cool. So that's our, our app. So let's actually see how it's built. Um, so this is straight from, from the actual GitHub repo. Uh, basically, you've got uh, a JS folder. It has app.jsx. No one uses that file extension anymore, so don't. And we'll actually change it in a bit. Uh, and then we've got a footer, a to-do item, a to-do model, some utils, an index page. And that's pretty much it. Fairly, fairly small project. Not much is going on here. Um, but let's, let's pop a look and, and see what's happening here. Is this big enough for everybody? Can everybody see this? Great. Um, so we've, we see here, this is our index page. Looks fairly straightforward. You know, we've got some CSS here. Uh, we've got a, a bunch of modules that we're loading. Notice this. It's using JSX Transformer. I think that's the tool that takes the JSX and turns it into JavaScript. We're going to strip that out because it's not making sense anymore. Uh, and then it uses the di director. I actually had to look what director, look up what director was. And it's a routing tool. Uh, it's not React Router, uh, which is my preferred one. So I'm also going to strip that out. Um, but basically, it, it, you know, it, it's a very straightforward app. There's our, you know, our loading of, of the files that we have. You, see, you notice that it goes in a specific order. Um, so that's not going to be needed anymore once we use, uh, once we use Webpack to bumble, uh, bundle everything together. Um, but at the end, it loads up app.jsx, which I assume is where most of the app is. Um, so if I take a look here, I've got you know, some constants at the top, like enter key equal 13. I assume that's the key code. Uh, and then I've got my react.create class. So this looks like it's my first main component. I've got some initial state here. Uh, I'm doing the routing inside componented mount, which is very bizarre. So we're going to not do that anymore. Uh, and then um, I have some handling functions here. I got some toggle, all that stuff. And it's interesting. If I look inside toggle, it's using props.model.toggle. Okay, that gives me a hint that maybe it's the, they actually have an object for the, to, to represent the model, model uh, which is to do model. So, okay. They have a very classical JavaScript object to manage the state of every single to-do, all the to-do items. Okay, so you know what? We're going to keep this, although probably in React that's not the, the way you might want to go. You might want to take a, uh, use the actual components to hold to the state or maybe use uh, Redux. Uh, but for today, we're just going to stick with this, all right? Um, so, you know, I can see all the, the model functions here, fairly straightforward. Uh, I've got my footer here, and that's clearly the, the thing that has the, 
Um, basically the all the, the buttons at the, at the bottom here. So I think that's this guy right here, that's my footer. And in fact, I can actually take a look at it if I open up my dev tools. You know, I just wanna confirm to you, cause I know what the answer is, but I just wanna make sure that you guys believe me. So if I take a look at React here, there's my to-do app, there's my to-do footer. I have to-do items as well. So that's, those are other React components as well. Um, so basically that's roughly what our application looks like right now as it is. All right, so there's a couple of things we immediately need to do to even start thinking about uh, reactifying this. So uh, there's a bunch of stuff. One is I actually checked the React version. It's not even 1.0, it's like 0 0.13. So we're gonna update that right away. Um, and then I'm gonna install React DOM because it's not using the React DOM. I'm gonna install React Router, Babel, Webpack, and I'm gonna add a webpack.config.js file. I'm gonna rename the JavaScript folder to source, also rename the file extensions, replace the script and link to point to bundles, and update this very old school JS like namespacing method that uses like var app equal app equal or object, okay? And then we're gonna start using a more modern uh, module bundling system. And then I'll cover the last steps before I, I move on. So I'm just gonna leave this folder, I'm gonna go into my step one folder and I'm gonna show you what I started doing here. Um, so you'll notice I renamed all the, all the file extensions, okay? But I, I started doing this. I started actually popping things out. Um, so here's the function render. This was the same as it's inside um, the app.jsx here. It's actually at the bottom right here. So that's, that's how we're rendering the main application. You'll notice there's no React DOM. So that's uh, clear that this is an old version of React. So in our new one, we actually have React DOM. We're just gonna render the to-do app. This is fairly straightforward, not much changes. We're still creating this to-do model. Uh, but what's something that's interesting here is that we actually are subscribing to any change inside our to-do model, uh, and then we're gonna render. So that's not gonna work for us, especially when we're trying to do that on the back end, and we have a router when we add that in. So that's not gonna work, so we're gonna change that. Um, the first step is mostly us like modern, modern, modernizing uh, the, uh, the, the, the to-do um, MVC app. So there's not too much like that's interesting. So I'm gonna go through this really quickly. If there is something that you want me to spend more time on, please raise your hand and ask me. Um, but uh, for the most part, this is not too relevant for our talk, but it is important that we actually do this to make it make sense for us. Um, so I've stripped this out. I've taken the actual to-do app and put it in its own JavaScript file. Okay, you've got our create class here. I'm importing things. You'll notice I have added a constants file. So that's where all my constants are. Okay, you can stop. Uh, and then, you know, I'm exporting the constants, so they're, they're the same everywhere. Uh, the to-do app, I didn't do very much here. All I did was I, I commented out the router because we're just not gonna use that right now. Uh, and then that's pretty much it when it comes to the to-do app. Uh, the to-do footer, I also did the same thing. Uh, just uh, basically fixed things up a little bit, not very much changes. I'm using uh, the, I'm actually importing the class names now, as a, which was this function that the original MVC app was using. It just assumed that it was in the namespace and I'm actually importing it now uh, using node, uh, well, the ES6 import method. Um, so clearly, like, when we start putting this app together, just to make it work again, like it did before, we need to bundle it up using Webpack. So that's, that was the next step that I did. I actually added a webpack.config.js. Now, I'm just gonna go through this real quick because it's, it is important, but it's not the main point of the, the, the module here. Um, but you'll notice that we have Webpack, we have the entry point being the app.js file. Uh, just, you know, we're outputting to the static, we have a bundle name, uh, and then we're using Babel to actually uh, pre-compile everything with the presets of ES2015 and React. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I mentioned that I added all these dependencies. That makes sense, that's all cool. And uh, what happens here is the minute I actually run this, um, I've actually also added some stuff to um, the npm file, the package.json file to have npm scripts so that I can actually run this using Webpack. All right, so if I go back into this, into step one, and do npm run, or we can even just npm start. It's just starting Webpack here, and then the application will look roughly similar, but we actually broke a few things. Uh, we broke the, the routing here. It's no longer, and also the port, it is no longer 3000. So this is what our new application looks like. Oh, 
oh, sorry, it's 8080. Okay, it looks roughly similar. There's a different local storage here, but you know this is still working. Uh, and let's say we add something right here, and then I, I make this completed. Completed doesn't do anything because we broke that. We removed the router, so that's that's off. Um, so there's you know it's roughly similar, but it's it's uh, we we've, we've changed some things quite a bit. Um, so we did that all in step one, and m the whole point of this was mostly to be able to start bundling this together. Because when we when we start looking at how we move this to the the server side, we're going to need Webpack, and we're going to need to bundle things properly. So that's good. So now let's move on to step two, and that's to we need to go back and fix our React routing. Okay. So we remove uh, the rector. We're going to put React Router instead. Uh, so we're going to add a routes.js file with an app layout. Um, so this is a, a component that we're just, it's just going to hold um, the to-do app, depending on where we are in the URL. So if it's the active or the completed uh, view. Uh, and then we're going to ensure that to-do app is the properly refreshing the React components. Uh, and then we're going to use the React Router link. So that's pretty much step two. So let's go into this. Go into step two. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna add React Router here. So I have React Router and I'm pointing at this routes object. This is what the routes object looks like. Um, you'll notice that I have this app layout class that I've also created. All it does to render is it actually takes whatever props children it was given. All right, so React Router will pass a children's prop uh, to the app layout object. This is what's going to actually contain what component we're currently viewing. All right, so when I go ahead and actually create the routes here, I have a route path with a slash, and then I'm going to change the, the URL structure of the original app a little bit, uh, and I have an index redirect. So if you just put the slash and nothing else, I'm going to redirect it to sh slash show slash all to show all the, all the two items. And then I'm going to have the actual which ones you want to show as another path in there, and it's going to pop in the to-do app component. So it's going to create a to-do app component and then inject it into app layout. And app layout is very simple. It doesn't do anything besides add a diff. All right, so that's all I'm doing right here. Okay, But this is what's going to allow me to actually um, use React Router now, which is going to be handy when we move to the, to the back end as well. Um, if I go back into to-do app, I'm going to do a, a few things differently here. Um, first off, if you remember, uh, the original MVC app had the model sort of created at the top level, right? It was at the beginning. I'm actually going to shift that into the to-do apps itself, okay? And I, I took a look at inside to-do model. It actually doesn't do very, nothing very special, right? It uses this util object, uh, and these util functions are mostly just storing things uh, directly in local storage. So uh, there's not much, like, anything exciting going on in to-do model besides it has all these functions to do this stuff, but at this, uh, we can actually shift it into to-do app. That's okay. Um, so what I've done here is I've, I've actually taken it, uh, put the get default props, uh, and then I, uh, because it, it, it was passed in as a prop, the model was passed in as a prop, so I'm going to keep that the same. Uh, I'm just going to set it as the, one of the default props that gets passed in right away. So there's my uh, new to-do model, it's the same code as before. Um, but what's interesting is because I'm mov moving to React Router, now actually what state we're showing uh, so in other words, completed or active t tasks, that's going to be different. So I'm on the component did mount inside our React lifecycle, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set which props is showing uh, using uh, basically uh, the current um, parameter in the URL. All right. So all I'm doing is I'm calling this set showing function. Uh, it takes the next props, takes the params, takes the show variable, which is going to be active or completed. Uh, it checks against the constants, so this was the originally in uh, in the to-do MVC app how they were doing it, but they weren't doing it with the componented mount lifecycle. They were doing it uh, during the um, uh, routing cycle. So I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm just going to use I'm just going to do it here and then set the state uh, directly. So I'm going to say, hey, I'm now showing completed to-dos, active to-dos, or all the to-dos. All right. So far, good. I haven't lost many of you. Oh, OK. Lots of heads nodding. That's great. Awesome. Um, the other thing that I'm going to do is, because Re the way React Router works, which is interesting, um, if it's moving from active to completed, it's not actually going to remove 
the component and then stick it back in, right? Like even if it's a different URL, it's actually just gonna send it new props, all right? Because we are using the same to-do app component. So we're gonna need to have another uh, override of the lifecycle life cycle function called component will receive props and then also again set next showing. All right, so once we've got these things set up, um, the React Router should just work as it was before, okay? And uh, if I wanted to check, there's a very easy way for me to do that. I can just go into that folder and then run it. There we go. So you'll notice that this doesn't work because there's no odd hashtag here. There we go, there's our React to do MVC app. It's loading. Okay, so now if I go into active, there's show active at the top right here. So we're not using the hashtag anymore, we're actually using real URLs, right? So when we start moving this to the, the server side, we know where to go. All right, so this is, this is another check mark on, on our many steps to universifying this app. Sweet, so we got that running. Uh, the other thing that I uh, didn't show, but I'll show real quick, is if I go back to my to-do footer component, okay, I was using uh, a straight-up anchor link, but here we're going to use the link from React Router. And this is just going to make it better for, for us when we're switching uh, components and links here. So fairly straightforward, right there. Okay, take a breather. It's already 5.15, <laughs> and I've got another 15 minutes to run through everything else. All right, let's do it. <laughs> So how do we actually re, uh, re render on the server side? So there's a couple of things we need to do. One is we need to, we need to actually take the index.html and make it into a template that we can inject code into. Uh, this is the same thing you do with Express and Jade, for example. Like Jade is the template, Express sends things into uh, the Jade template, renders it into HTML, sends it across to the browser. Uh, we're gonna do the same thing here. Uh, and then we're gonna add this new file, server.js, uh, that's gonna do the rendering and routing on the server side. Uh, obviously, we're going to need to add a local storage emulator because I, as I pointed out, utils.store actually uses local storage to, show, to share things. Um, that's something that only exists in the browser. It doesn't actually exist in Node. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to add in an emulator for local storage, okay? Um, and it's not going to be very important for us on the back end because we're, the user is not going to be interacting with our, our uh, server side uh, render of the app. They're, so we just need it to be there so that we don't need to change the code. So that the code still functions and we can still render our React um, uh, components on the back end just so we can send it over to the client side. And the client side, the local storage doesn't need to be, like it's gonna be the real thing, not an emulator of it. Okay, so uh, we need to add that in and then we're gonna fix a little bit our Webpack configuration so that it outputs properly um, the other static files that we're going to need now as well. So like the CSS that we had as well, we're going to want to also send that over uh, to our, our server side. So what does that look like? Okay, if I go back in here and I go into step three, you'll notice that I, I just renamed my index.html to index.ejs. This is just to make it easy to use the EJS engine. Uh, I've added express as well and EJS to my package.json, so everything's in there. And now I take a look at what my server.js file looks like. And this is where things get really interesting. Um, so the first thing that you're gonna notice that is that there's a whole bunch of stuff, but I'm also importing React inside Node, right? This file is gonna be executed by Node, right? And the nice thing about React is that you can run it server-side, like that's a, that's a thing you can do. So there we are, we're actually importing React. And we're gonna uh, import Express as well, and we're gonna import EJS, okay? We're gonna create a new Express app, uh, a new server app, that's just an HTTP server that's gonna uh, host our Express app. And then I'm gonna set my view engine to be EJS. I'm gonna tell it where to find these views. And really here, all I'm saying is just go to the top folder where I only have one view that I care about, which is index.ejs. I don't actually have anything else, so I don't really care too much about this. Uh, and then I'm gonna say, oh, by the way, there's some probably some other static files that you wanna serve, okay, like the CSS and the JavaScript. Uh, before we were using Webpack to host our app, now we're gonna want Node to actually send those files over. Uh, so that's what we're doing here. And then here's where things get interesting. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna take everything, all the URLs that hit my Node server, and then I'm gonna use the routing engine inside uh, React itself 
to actually do the right thing. So here, that's how I, I'm basically putting in a star to app.get. Uh, it's going to send me a request, uh, um, uh, request comma res, uh, response object. That's how that's the, the standard uh, object that you get from Express when when you get a new uh, um, uh, request from H DHCP, basically. Uh, and then I'm going to basically use the match function, okay, which I'm going to get from React Router, all right, to be able to match um, the request.url. With the right, with the, my routes object, the same one that I that's hosting, like inside my my front end, I'm gonna use the same routes object on my server side, okay? Sorry, okay? And I'm gonna use the same React router as I do on my front end on my on my node side to match against my routes object the current requested URL. And what that's gonna give me is gonna give me a couple of things. One is if there is a redirect location, so in other words, if you need to redirect from this URL to another one, or finally, it's going to give me the render props object, which is where we're going to be able to render uh, our router context. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in here, uh, check for errors, check for redirect location, and then actually generate the React markup for this current route. So the way we do that is we actually use the router context, we give it the render props, okay, so that figures out what part of my React router uh, it needs to go into, so what part of my app it needs to actually uh, take, and then it using the render to string, which is a function inside React, the React DOM, I'm going to render this to a string. So I'm not going to render this to the actual DOM, to the browser, because there is no browser, I'm running a node here, okay, I'm going to render it to a string, and I'll take that string, put it in markup, all right, and then when I go down to return my response inside Express, you'll see the res.render function. That's, that's an express function. I'm just going to pass it this object that has the markup vari variable in it to the index property, uh, uh, the index view. And if I go inside my index view, I reference markup right here inside the same section that I was rendering directly to on my browser side. So now if I actually run this, OK, you'll notice that in my package.json, I have some new scripts here new uh, uh, start server script. It's just going to use Babel node to start up server JS. Okay. If I take this and I run this, one, you'll notice that it looks very different from this output here. It's just going to run a, a standard node application at port 3000. There we go. And now if I go to port 3000, there's my uh, React app. It's the same one. You'll notice there's a different local storage here. And we're also uh, using the emulator. And I'll show you where I did that change as well in a second. But just to prove to you that this came straight from the URL, I'm going to go into here, my document itself. This is the response that it got. Data React root. This is what was sent over the network. So I sent the full React application directly over the network, and it's the same stuff that I have on the front end. Right? And all it did, all, all that happened afterward is that when, I, when app.js started running, it picked up the HTML markup and continued execution from there. We've unified it. <laughs> it's, oh, thank you. <laughs> And now I can use my word. We've universalified it. That was the word I was looking at. And then I said unified it. I don't know why. OK, cool. But just to show you, we actually have to do the, the emulator thing. Um, so there's a module called DOM storage. Okay, It's local storage and session storage. It's the same APIs, the exact same APIs that the W3C DOM standard has, uh, but for Node.js. Okay? And all I did was inside my utils here, I actually went to the top and I import storage. Okay? And then I check to see if local storage exists. Now in Node, that's going to be undefined because it doesn't exist. It's not a browser. So I'm just going to reset it to be this new storage objects from my DOM storage. And then if you look at my uh, exports.store code, it's still the exact same thing. So there we go. It's like the full app that's running on the browser side, now rendering on the, the, the server side and being sent over to the browser. Um, 
Now, this is great and all, right? So I'm building this fairly complex app, but you know, this data obviously is not going to reside inside local storage on the server side. Like That's not what's, where we're going to put this data, right? We actually want to have proper data access. So that's pretty much the next step, all right? And this idea of universal data retrieval. So um, ideally, your API uh, or data server is not equal to your app server. So the thing that like, sends the application, the web app itself, should not be the same place where, in, and definitely not the same project, where you have like a, an API server or like a data server of some kind. Like that's not what you should be doing. You should have those things separated out, right, ideally. Um, and the other thing that we want is we actually want, also want to use the Fetch API, uh, which is this new uh, standard for remote data retrieval. So it's a new way for you to do AJAX calls, but it's a much cleaner interface. It's called Fetch. Uh, you might have seen it in a couple of new tutorials. It's, it's really important. But what's interesting here is because we're going to be using fetch, all right, and, and it's, it's a new way for us to do requests, um, there are actually fetch libraries that work in both Node and the browser. So the same way that we're going to do a REST call to an API server on the browser side, we're also going to, same code, is going to do it on the server side to go get data to render and then send to the browser. So we're going to do it on both sides the same way. So it's literally, again, a universal application all right, the full, fully run in with no distinction between whether it's on the server side or on the client side that it, where it's running. So how do we do that? There's a couple of libraries, uh, and I'll show you like some sample code. It's, it's really simple. Um, I'm not gonna go back into my code here just to, to show you these, these fetch functions, but this is basically what it looks like. Uh, there's one called isomorphic-fetch. It's pretty much the most popular library out there right now for doing this. Uh, you just npm install it, and um, the only thing that it requires is uh, for you to use the polyfill for the ES6 promises, and if that bothers you, there's a couple of other libraries that don't require you to do that, um, but essentially, we call fetch, give it some API somewhere, and then do whatever we want with the JSON response, and this will run on both sides, including the browser and the, and the client side. Uh, there's another one called Axios. It's promise-based. Uh, again, it works on both sides, browser and Node.js. It looks a little bit different, but it, it's uh, fairly uh, the same goal here. We just do axios.get, works on both sides. Um, Vision Media, so uh, this is actually TJ Holloway, Chuck's um, GitHub username. Uh, he's the guy who wrote Express, did some really cool other libraries too, but one of them is actually Super Agent. Uh, it's very similar to um, the other libraries. It's a uh, client-side HTTP request, but it's also a Node.js module with the same API and many of the same high-level features. So you would just do npm install and then start using request, uh, the, the super agent library, to just do post, to send stuff, to do whatever you need to do uh, on both sides. So that's pretty much all we would need to do to universalify an app. Uh, and if you notice, I took an existing React app and did this, right? So you can take your, your existing React app and do the exact same thing. There's going to be a bunch of tweaks that you'll need to do, but for the most part, it just roughly like translates, right? And, and I just picked the, the to-do MVC app because pretty much most of you are familiar with it, and it does something useful, right? It's not just hello world. Um, so the next thing I sort of want to talk to you about is how do you actually structure your application and your environment to make sense of it? Because obviously you notice I had my uh, source file, and I added server.js in there, and I had app.js in there. It's quite confusing, right? So how do you actually structure your app? Um, so this is something that I've, I've noticed a bunch of different projects doing. I think it's useful. Uh, here's how I, I would say, I think you should do it too. Uh, and the idea here is you would have a client folder. Uh, this would have a components folder. That's where you put all your React components. Uh, you would have your app.js. That's how you bootstrap your single page application. You have routes.js that just has the client side routes. Um, and then inside your server, you might have a few folders in there like models or, and controllers. That's if you really, really insist on having everything in the same, in the same um, backend, in case, well, and that's where you would put it, right? Um, but you would have maybe another views folder and then your server.js. Your server.js could require from your client side, and it actually will, to get the routes, all right? So um, it, it can in this setup. Uh, and then your index.js is a very simple like entry point level thing that just runs Babel and then runs your server code. Your package.json is your package.json. Webconfig, the webpack config is your webpack config. Um, this structure is extremely simple. 
and it seems to work. The, the, the caveat with universalifying stuff is that folks tend to overcomplicate things when you don't need to. And you saw how I did it with a very simple to do MVC app, it did the job. Um, that's the, the main caveat that I see when folks are doing universal apps, is that it becomes extremely complicated. They have all of these things that they're doing at the same time. You don't need that. It's actually quite simple to render React on the back end and send that over to the browser. All right, so just keep it simple. This works, um, and it's worked for a bunch of folks. No need to make it more complicated. But let's say that, okay, you know, this, I, I'm not you know, very comfortable doing this on my own. I want some framework or some tool or some scaffold that actually gives it to me right away. Um, so here's a few of them. Uh, the first one's called MERN. Uh, they call themselves the easiest way to build universal JavaScript applications using React and Redux. And it's, it's really good. It's actually a good uh, pattern I've noticed. It follows a little bit the MVC pattern. So if you're familiar with that, it's not going to be too uh, different for you. And it does the job. And it has a CLI tool that lets you keep, um, basically you can use it to keep adding things uh, to your project after you're done, like the initial scaffold. So that's, it's a really useful tool. Um, and then the next one is probably the most popular one that I've seen so far. Uh, and a lot of folks are actually using this. Uh, it's called Next.js, and I'm going to do a, a really quick demo. I know I have five minutes left, but um, really quickly here, uh, you have to keep in mind that this is probably um, overkill and maybe like too much for most folks. They don't actually really need to do this type of thing, but it, it does have some really interesting features. So a couple of things that it does, uh, it actually has the file system be the API. So you notice in my single page app, my two MVC, I only had one page, right? So there's no need to, f their philosophy is that there's no need to have these complicated folder structures and this routing and these, all these different JavaScript files. Um, it would just read the folder pages and whatever page and whatever file you had in there would be an endpoint in your URL. And that's, that's pretty much it. So that's uh, something that it does. Uh, everything's a JavaScript function, right? There's no need to have all this extra stuff that's surrounding it. Uh, it, it does some really smart, thi smart things like uh, code splitting, so it doesn't just like package everything up as one bundle, it actually does some code splitting ahead of time, and it leaves data fetching up to the developer, so the way you do data fetching is up to you, it, it actually doesn't tell you, doesn't give you any opinion, and it does uh, a few things that are really useful for performance, so because we're rendering um, React on the, on the server side, we also have an advantage there because we know what links are going to be on the page, so we can, we can uh, create this prefetching Right, like the, way, the same way that the browser does prefetching on, on the browser side, we can sort of start doing that a little bit on the server side and send that over so that things are much faster to load as well, which is an interesting idea. Um, so really quick demo of Next.js. You'll see it's super simple. Uh, here I go in my Next.js demo. Uh, you'll notice that all I've got here is a pages file and the static, uh, p the pages folder and the static folder. Uh, the static folder, has static assets, that's it. It's already automatically sent over. And then my pages has just one pay, one file, index.js, okay, and it's exporting just one function, all right, div stuff, that's actually React. All right, like it's a very simple React-like thing, right? Like this will, this uh, JSX will transform into JS directly by next, and that's it. Um, they, they give you some built-in scripts to actually do this, because otherwise this wouldn't work. Right, there's no server code, nothing. Um, so the way that you can start this is you call next, all right, and then it would just boot this up, or next start if you wanted to uh, start the server. So let's, let me show you what that looks like. So I'm going to go into my next demo, and then I'm just going to go, sorry, I'm going to go npm start here, which is going to execute next start. And that's going to tell me it's ready. And if you remember, I only had one page, localhost. So if I go back here and I just give it that, hi, FITC, welcome to Next.js. So it, it went into my pages folder, figured out that there's an index file in there. So that's clearly like the slash. And that's it. And if I add another page, all I would need to do is just give it the name. Like the file name is now my URL. So it's an interesting idea. It's a, a universal, uh, definitely a universal framework. Uh, and it's fairly popular among certain developers. So um, that's Next.js. 
So honestly, I've seen the future. It's in my browser. And this slide has never been more perfect than like uh, this presentation, because it's literally we're taking stuff that's in the browser and putting it on the server side. So it is the future, I think. Um, and I love this slide, because it's almost in every single one of my presentations. And I see Matthew nodding in the background. Yes, it is. Uh, and that's because it's, it's awesome, and it's perfectly fitting here. Um, so what did we learn? What is universal JavaScript? How to write React on the back end? How to universalify a React app? How to structure your application? Some tools? What is Next.js? That's what we did. So high five, everyone. Woo! Thank you very much.